Hello, good morning. Um, it's Sunday the 21st, although not today because I'm recording this earlier, so it gets a bit complicated, but um, I hope you are well. And uh, here we are approaching Easter and so on. We're in this uh, series, uh, we are in a series entitled Small Beginnings, Do Not Despise. And this is drawn from the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 10. And um, this is the verse up on the screen there. Who dares to despise the day of small things, since the seven eyes of the Lord that range through the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hands of Zerubbabel? And we all know about Zerubbabel, don't we? Do you? Well, I don't. I, all I know about this is that the seven eyes refers to how perfect God sees everything. And the capstone, as you probably can pick up yourself, refers to Jesus himself. He's described as the capstone that the builders rejected. And I have absolutely no idea what the rest of it is on about. So let's move on. I've been asked to talk about parents. I've been given the key verse from Proverbs 23, 22. This says, listen to your father who begot you and do not despise your mother when she is old. So these verses take us to the perspective of how we are to, how we are to respect our parents, both when we're growing up and when we're getting older, throughout our lives, in other words. The reference of respecting our father does not specifically say anything about what age he is or how old we are. It's not age related in any sense. It simply says that we should listen to our dad throughout our lives. And when it refers to our mums, it specifically says that we should not disrespect her when she gets old. Does that mean it's okay to disrespect your mum when she's young? Before she gets old? No, I don't think so. You know, it's a fact that, generally speaking, women live longer than men. Oh, all right, you'll know hundreds of men who've outlived their wives, so I'm not being sort of pedantic about it. But statistically, it has always been a fact that women generally live longer than men. Why is that? Well, obviously, historically, when men went off to hunt, Leaving the women safely in the cave, the men would sometimes get killed by animals they would actually try to hunt, or they'd fall off a cliff, or they'd get hit by molten lava or a volcano exploding, something like that. That would leave the women to die slowly of starvation in the cave. But at least they live longer than the men did. Later on, when it was uh, society progressed, the men went off to work in the factory or the iron foundry, or perhaps down the mine. Again, it was the men who faced the dangers, while the women stayed safely at home, just looking after the kids, cooking and cleaning, and waiting for the men to bring the food home. But slightly more seriously, you know, it was a fact that going to work in sometimes was much more dangerous than it is perhaps today. In my own family, my grandfather, was killed down a coal mine and he was only 52 years old. He left my grand to live alone because by that time all their four daughters had grown up and left home. And from that time onward she lived alone uh, for several years at least. Perhaps here we have one of the many reasons why this verse tells us to listen to our dad's advice. It is perhaps saying, or there's a sort of element of it that says, listen to your dad while he's still around because one day you might not be there to help you. Then with regards to mums, as she gets older and less strong, perhaps by a certain time not having your dad around to support her as well, perhaps you start losing respect for her, perhaps. Perhaps she takes longer to do things, getting forgetful, and needs more help and all sorts of other things. So it's beginning to eat into your own free time and the freedom that you enjoyed before. How tolerant are we going to be about that sort of situation? And it's worth noting at this point what this verse does not say. It does not say that you should necessarily agree with what your father said. 
It simply says that you should listen to what he says. Now, if you listen to your father and you like what you hear, it's easy to follow the advice. However, if you listen and don't like what you hear, it's, easy, it's much more difficult. You then have to decide whether or not to follow the advice or not. Balancing this verse with other similar verses in the Bible, the scriptures clearly teach us that children should be obedient to their parents. As children, the scripture says we should simply obey them. I'm talking about children now, not adults. In the Jewish culture where this was written, that was children up to the age of 13. And from 14 onwards, you were regarded as being a man. That was when you had your bar mitzvah. And after that, from the age of 14 onwards, the emphasis moved from being simply obedient to respecting them. Because by then, as a man, you should have matured enough to know that your parents usually know what's best for you anyway. But then you were theoretically now able to see that much more clearly than when you were younger. Therefore, you would be more in agreement than ever. Well, that's the theory anyway. And in the culture of that time, apparently, it sort of worked. But that was a society where people didn't live as long as we tend to live today. They sort of had to grow up faster in those days. Life was shorter, so you got through it quicker, as you might say. Young people were often married in their teens, and people rarely lived beyond their 50s. There were, of course, exceptions to that, but this was the general situation for the average person. However, in our Western and so-called modern culture, people generally live longer. You used to come of age at 21, but now it's 18, and generally speaking, we don't normally get married quite so young, with exceptions, of course. Clearly, though, not all 14-year-olds in our culture have matured to the point where differences of opinion and thus conflict does not arise. Young people are now, quite rightly, encouraged to think for themselves, and so they should. If the parenting has been good, and the relationship between parent and child is strong, then even if a child does not agree with or, or like the advice or instructions being given, they will be mature enough to know that their parents knows best. But if family life and parenting has not been perfect, then the conflicts arise. In reality, of course, no one's life is perfect. And any parent who thinks they got it right all the time are just delusional. So this is where this verse hits it on the head, I think. It talks about honouring. Honour, or respect, is the key to avoiding conflict. In any situation where there is a difference of opinion, if both sides can respect each other and talk to each other and listen to each other, then issues can usually be resolved. It's not a case of blind obedience or one side dominating the other into subservience. It's all about honouring and respecting each other and moving forward together. And that should apply across the generations. If you know your Bible, you've probably realized that honoring your parents is actually one of the Ten Commandments. Maybe, um, however, you're thinking, what's the Ten Commandments? Well, there they are. The Ten Commandments. Not long after Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and the slavery, God took Moses up this mountain, Mount Sinai, in the desert, and, it, and it, the Bible tells us that God met Moses and, and gave him these ten laws. It's, this is the sort of shortened version of them. They were etched on two stone tablets, not little tablets that you swallow, they were about the size of a sort of modern day laptop, I guess. It, just about heavy enough, you know, to be able to be carried by Moses, one man. 
The Ten Commandments were a set of rules that the people of God were instructed to follow so that their new society, now free from the slavery and bondage of Egypt, that they could build this new society based on rules that God had given them. It was, it was a set of guidelines that would be a good and fair way to live together. And they were so good that even our society today is still largely based on these laws. But sadly, like old gravestones that weather over time, these laws have become eroded. And our modern world has turned further and further away from them, from God. And we have all seen the problems that are continuing to arise from that. But let's come back to the main point. We're talking really about honouring our parents. The first four commandments here, if you, if you study them at your own leisure, you'll see the first four are relating to God. They talk about honouring God. They tell him to put God first in our lives. And that was the sermon that was preached the night I got saved. I can remember it so clearly. Put God first in your life. And I responded to that and became a Christian that night. So the first four are about pointing to God. They tell us to put him first and then it tells us to take a day off. So it's almost like put your emphasis on God and then have a little rest. So on that day we are supposed to focus on him, this is what we now celebrate as Sunday, and still honour him for the other six days of the week though. So it's not a sort of only do it that day, it's all about resting and thinking of God in particular on the one day. But let's move on to commandment number five. This one jumps straight to our parents. So after honouring God, the next in line is to honour our parents. Isn't that amazing? It focuses directly. Honour your father and your mother, it says. And then immediately it tells us why we should do that. It says, you will live longer. The old King James Version, I think, puts it like, you will live long in the land. Now, who doesn't want to live a long time? Hands up? Both hands? Yes, of course we do. And God told us, right there at the very beginning of setting out our rules for society, that if we honour our parents, we will live longer in the land. Wow. Now take the converse of that. If you dishonour your parents, your life will be over sooner than you thought. <laughs> Does that mean you'll be struck by lightning if you're cheeky to your parents? Probably not, but you know. But it's a scientific fact that people who are regularly and frequently angry, lose their cool, people who get stressed a lot, people who don't take good advice and just sort of carry things and hold on to things and keep all their worries and stress on themselves, actually do shorten their lives. Stress, anger and worry can eventually kill you. So I see there that even at this early time in, in history, God was concerned that, first of all, we should honour him, because that's fundamental to life, because he's the creator and everything. But his next thought, as it were, was for our safety. Honour your parents, and then you live a long time. You won't kill yourself, as it were. So even before God went on in these Ten Commandments to tell us not to kill and murder, not to steal, and not to be jealous, and so on. Not to order more stuff from Amazon, and not to be jealous of your neighbor's car and their fridge. Not to commit adultery. He told us to honor our parents. Isn't that amazing? All those things that still today, our laws are based on do not kill, do, you know, do not murder, do not steal. Those are the things that concern most of the law these days, you know, violence and murder and theft. But that's put after honouring our parents. That's how important it is. It comes immediately after instructions about honouring God and immediately before instructions that we now call crime. So 
So let's, so it's clear, it's absolutely clear that God wants us to honour and respect our parents. And I think it, it actually means to do that whether they are still alive or not. He promises if we do, we'll live longer. And that's great. So, there you are. It's dead easy, isn't it? We all have great parents, so it's easy to love them. No problem. We can all go out on Mother's Day, or probably last week you did, buy flowers and chocolates for mum, and buy dad a new electric drill, or a giant Toblerone. Not that I'm hinting, the Father's Day is coming up sometime soonish. Very easy, simples, as the meerkats would say. Of course, the trouble is that not all parents are actually good parents. Some parents are absolutely awful. How many cases have there been of abuse in the home? How many cases have there been of one or both parents so abusing their kids they've even killed them, kidnapped them? There was that story over the woman that announced their daughter had gone missing and she'd actually stuffed her in the loft and was trying to make money out of it and all of that. Bad husbands, bad wives, bad parents. And the downward spiral continuing from one generation to the next. Because if you've been brought up well, if you haven't been brought up well, I should say, if your parenting, if, the, if your parents were not good parents to you, how would you learn to be good parents to your children? It just carries on in this sort of downward spiral. Do you know that most murderers are related to their victim? That's, you can look it up on government statistics, it'll tell you that. Female victims are statistically most at risk of being killed by a partner or an ex-partner or a family member than a complete stranger. Now there are obviously exceptions, we've had a recent case of that poor woman killed, murdered and it's caused uproar hasn't it on this, about the safety of our streets and this was to a complete stranger to her. But that is really exceptional. Male victims too are more likely to be killed by a friend or an acquaintance than by a complete stranger. But they are less at risk than women. Women get the raw deal. If you've had a bad experience with one or both of your parents, how on earth are you going to honour and respect them? This is not an easy question. It's a tough one. And what exactly does honour mean anyway? I thought, let's dig into this a bit. So I googled the word honour and even found the definition of the he in the Hebrew language. Now, I'm not a Hebrew speaker, I'm not a, um, a professor of anything, but uh, this was interesting. Hebrew, of course, was the original language that the Old Testament was written in, and it says in the Hebrew that the word honour is found in four different parts. Now, this slide should move forward but it's not. So I have a technical problem. Pointing it in all directions. And here we go. You see the first one there, it's pronounced yaka, I think. And it means costly. The second one is similar. And it's pronounced, it means, the meaning, the essence of it is respectful. And then you've got yoga, or yoga, which means expensiveness. And then you've got yaga, where it means appreciative. This is all the one word, honor, in the Hebrew with different sort of slants of meaning. And these meanings emphasize and give us further clues as to how we can honor God. I was intrigued to see the reference to expensiveness. In some scenarios, it can cost us something. 
to honour our parents. Now, I don't just mean the cost of buying flowers, overpriced flowers on Mother's Day. That's not quite what it's getting at. But if you've got less than perfect parents, and really imperfect parents, you might need to grit your teeth to show them some respect. Depending on how bad they've treated you, you might really need to steel yourself and brace yourself to honour them. In that sense, it can be quite costly. Is it optional? Well, no, it's not. The Bible doesn't say that if you've had good parents, you need to show your appreciation. That's not what the commandment is. It simply says, honour them. Honour your parents. You may live long in the land. It's a bit like the other really hard verse in the Bible, the one that says, love your enemy and do good to those who do you harm. That's a great verse, isn't it? Now that verse, was it... Was it um, was it actually made by um, someone who uh, was like one of these strange prophets who made all these long-winded and obscure sort of sayings that you can interpret in different ways? Well, no, it wasn't actually. It was said by the Lord Jesus himself. He said, love your enemy and do good to those who do you harm. Not if they do you harm, but those who do you harm. And Jesus said that. Wow. It wasn't written by some obscure chap. This was the God, God's son, Jesus. Now that can be really difficult to apply. Can you think of anybody that's really hurt you and harmed you? Because the Bible says you're supposed to do good to them. Let's be clear about this. Honouring your parents does not mean giving in to every bit of abuse or to, from anyone at all. Honouring your parents does not mean taking it all the time like that. It's how you respond. If it's necessary to withdraw or even escape from parental abuse, or at whatever age you happen to be, young or old, then you should do so. But you need to find a way to do it that still honours the fact that they remain your parents, because they do remain your parents. You, you cannot change that. And that can be tough, really tough. It might mean literally distancing yourself, but still keeping in touch. That might be the way to do it. Uh, it definitely means not bad-mouthing them. But that does not mean that you still can't reveal their abuse to the appropriate authorities. Abuse does need to be challenged. How you go about it is the tricky bit. And abuse, of course, can take many forms. Verbal abuse can range from screaming and shouting to just subtle little jibes and digs that continuously dig into you and, and, and put you down. Imagine the young child who makes, makes something at school, um, comes to the school gates, met by mum, and shows mum, proudly shows, well, look what I've made, mum. And mum's response, in a sort of joking way, not meaning to be uh, nasty, but just says, oh dear, more junk to take home. Imagine getting eight GCSEs, going home, tell you, mum or dad, and their response is, oh, how come you didn't get the nine then? Imagine taking your new girlfriend home to meet your parents, only to be told afterwards, mm, she's a bit tall, she's a bit short, or she's a bit bossy. How do you still honour your parents when you have those experiences and those memories? Well, one thing that might be helpful is to try and understand what made them like that in the first place. Were they abused as a child? Do they lack self-confidence? So they always try and bring people down as a means of building themselves up. I mean, what about academically? If you've been academically successful, if you've got your O-levels and your A-levels and your, your degree or whatever, have you been more academically successful than they were? So they perhaps feel ashamed 
They might be embarrassed. Or they might just feel, just feel plain stupid. Or they might be jealous. All these things will affect the way they interact with you. Perhaps they were actually quite clever, but because of the generation they were in, they never had any chance to progress. I know both my parents left school when they were 14 and 15 years old. I mean, it was the last century, but let's not go into that. So, you need to think about that. We might need to, th to think on those things, because that will affect the way they interact with you. And what about you? What about me? Do we aggravate them? As a kid, was I always crying and miserable? Was I always negative? Was I demanding? Did I just cry a lot? W was I always um, never satisfied? What was I like? What were you like when you were little? Because that will have affected your parents. Now, there's another perspective. Have you You've grown up now, you've still got these parents, they're still alive. Have you got their, your eye on inheriting their house? They say if you want to find long lost relatives, the thing to do is to die because they'll all turn up to hear the will being read. Now there is a flaw in that idea, so I don't recommend it. It might even be safer to live in a council house. That, that, that stops all this inheritance nonsense. But what are you thinking? What's your plan? What's your long-term thoughts about your parents? The thing too is, whilst everyone has had two birth parents, you may have only had one. Or you might not have had any birth parents. What I'm saying is, you might, excuse me, <coughs> You might never have known your parents. You might be adopted. My own daughter, my eldest daughter, was adopted and she simply didn't know her own parents because she was only 11 days old when she came into care. She has no memory of them at all, of course. Each of these scenarios will affect the way that you relate and honour your birth parents and your adoptive parents. But that brings us back to the main point of this message. The Bible tells us to honour our parents so that we will live long in the land. The responsibility is on all of us to find a way to do that. And if you have no idea where to start, then I would suggest that you find someone that you trust so that you can talk to them about it. If you don't really want to do that, Get online, Google it, find some good balanced advice and make a start. Last, just this last Wednesday, Mark in the midweek ministry thought for the, thought for the week, mentioned the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Comes from Philippians 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can't split that verse up. You can't say, I can do all things because I'm a Christian. No, I can do all things through Christ. It's Christ that helps us with these difficult situations. If you don't know where to start, turn to him. When we admit that we don't know, we don't, rather, when we admit that we don't have what it takes, to do the right thing. God steps in and offers to strengthen us. Our role is to find out what he wants and do it. And then, but before you do it, you have to decide to do it. It's an act of will. It's not sort of automatic. When God gave his people the Ten Commandments, he knew they would not be able to obey each and every one of them. He, he must have known. God knows everything and he knows us. So he knew. So was God sort of setting us impossible goals? Was he just playing around with us, showing off, just teasing us? Well, no, God doesn't work like that, does he? What he was doing was showing his people 
what the perfect situation was and saying, look, aim for this. It was more than just do your best. It was like, this is your target. This is what you should aim for. I mean, even in the New Testament, I haven't got the verse to hand, but it says, be perfect, even as I am perfect. I think Jesus said it. Well, he knows we can't be perfect. We are not perfect, but he's setting us the goal. That's where you are aiming for. Now, when I was doing uh, my homework on preparing this message, I came across a sermon where the Ten Commandments were used as a sort of structure to hang this one commandment, the fifth commandment, the one we've been focusing on today. So here are the Ten Commandments about honoring your parents. Ah, oh, here we go, it's working again. Number one, you shall remember that they are the only birth parents you will ever have. Number two, you should not think that God should have given you different and better parents. Number three, you shall not be rude to them or badmouth them. Commandment number four, you shall give your parents a break now and then, even if it's only an occasional sleepover. And when you're old enough, leave home as soon as you can support yourself. Number five, you should look for ways to appreciate them. And if you still live at home with them, when you start work, pay them a rent. Because if you do, you live longer yourself. Number seven, you shall not care more for other parents, including your in-laws, than you do for your own. Number eight, you shall not steal from them by selling their antiques, getting them to take out equity release on their house, getting them to pay for your holidays. Unless, of course, they offer in the first place. You know, then it could be okay. Number nine, you shall not exaggerate their faults. And number 10, you shall not be jealous that they live in a bigger house, drive a better car, or have a snazzier TV, or a better computer than you have. Now that was a little bit lighthearted, so I, hope I don't get a load of emails now criticizing me. I'm not trying to rewrite the Bible. And I did steal the idea from another guy online. So those are my defenses, and I'm sticking to that. But maybe if you look back at them, you can, it'll make you think. They say that Rome wasn't built in a day. You'll have heard that saying. So don't expect instant miracles, if I can use that word. Don't expect instant change if you're struggling with some of these issues we've touched on. Situations that may have taken years to develop and to, to even come out and to emerge won't be sorted in a day or two. The theme that we've been working through these last weeks and next week as well is do not despise small beginnings. The important thing is to begin. Begin small. Appreciate the fact and acknowledge the fact that you have begun. You've, you've recognized the situation you know that changes need to be made in yourself and in the situation, so make a start. Hold on to that and keep going. And that's the message I wanted to bring today. I wanted to close with a prayer. And again, this is a little bit light-hearted, so please don't jump on me if you think it's inappropriate. But I would just suggest that you take and apply to your own situation any parts of these prayers that really do apply to you, because none of them might apply to you, but we'll see. And the prayer is, Dear Lord, please help me to remember only the parts of this sermon that are worth remembering. And thank you, Lord, that that won't be very much. I have a bossy parent, Lord. They're really past it. They're really out of touch. 
Please help me to understand why they are like that. Lord, one of my parents, well actually Lord, it's both of them, don't, they know nothing. They don't understand me. Lord, I'm 13 now. Please help me to be patient until they grow up. Father, I am actually a pensioner now, and I still have an aged mum. Please give me strength. Oh, and Lord, last of all, please help me to remember that the Bible says that if I do all that, I'll live longer. Amen.